Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, that's better. Um, thank you so much uh, for uh, being with us uh, this morning. And so we are going to go ahead and get started because we do have a full um, morning with you and want to make sure that we utilize our time as effectively as we can. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to those that are remotely at the other side. Um, welcome and good morning to you too. And Thank you for letting us know. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started, um, first of all, um, uh, with introductions. And then I do have to give some thanks uh, before we actually get into our topic of today. And so my name is Mayra Cruz. I am um, the uh, Area B representative for the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges. And uh, uh, teach at the Anza College in Cupertino, um, early childhood educator. And so um, I'm uh, excited to be here with you uh, today. And uh, I would like to ask Greg to introduce himself. Can everybody hear me? There we go. Good morning, I'm Greg Smith. I'm the Associate Vice President of Human Resources at Shasta College. Anybody know where Shasta College is? A few, a few more than I normally get. Yeah, so up in the far north, about um, 400 miles north of here. And you might be wondering why um, if you know anything about Shasta College and that area, it's predominantly white, about 90% between the three counties that our college serves. And if you're wondering why would a white male from one of the least diverse part of the states be here talking to us about EEO and diversity, very briefly, my background before I came to the community college system in 2016, I worked for a dozen years for the Department of Labor in an agency very similar to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, but not nearly as widely known. Um, but what that agency did was enforce EEO and affirmative action law. And affirmative action in the federal government does not mean quotas or things that it has been attributed to in education in California. But from that background, I was very interested in coming to public education in a system that I graduated from. I, I went to Saracoso Community College too many years ago. Um, and stop working to try to prevent discrimination from happening by working with contractors in an enforcement mode and work on developing systems and processes where discrimination never happens, where equity and EEO are fundamentally built into everything that we do. And so it's been very rewarding three years so far. And I've had a chance to do a lot of work with APRO, the statewide HR group, um, and now with Academic Senate, um, on how to embed these principles into all of the practices that we have into our culture so that our decision making reflects that. And so I'm here in that capacity representing AFRO, working with Academic Senate on ways that we can make positive progress in that. Thank you so much for having me here. And so um, I hope that you did receive a, a, a little bio of both of us. So I'm going to actually skip my remarks about my bio um, just because uh, I'm mindful of time and there's a lot of things that we want to do today. Uh, but I do want to uh, make sure that um, you are aware that uh, the Academic Senate has um, uh, made um, the goal of faculty diversification a priority. And this year, we started working on um, faculty diver diversification uh, items uh, last year and continue to do so this year. And so part of what you're going to be um, taking a look at and hopefully working through today uh, is uh, uh, those areas that we, in fact, we are closely looking at, uh, particularly in the hiring process and the preparation of the members um, uh, for the uh, Equal Employment um, Opportunity uh, uh, Committees, or um, actually representatives, not the committees, but the representatives. And so before we get started, Um, before we get started, uh, I would like to, um, first of all, uh, um, thank you all for being here uh, today. 
and for uh, your um, commitment um, to this work. Um, equity, diversity, and inclusion work um, as it relates to um, faculty hiring it's, uh, has become a critical uh, um, uh, issue for us in uh, community colleges. And uh, you know it's not new. We've been at this for quite some time. And so I'm gonna ask you uh, today um, uh, to open your hearts and open your minds to thinking differently and in new ways. Um, and uh, in new ways that allows, allows you uh, to work with each other and, uh, um, and, um, and to achieve that, that you want around faculty hiring outcomes. So um, I'd like to take a moment to uh, uh, thank uh, a few folks that were actually very important in um, the organization of this, um, of this session. Uh, certainly, uh, my co-facilitator, um, Greg Smith, um, it's, been, it's been delightful to work with him, uh, representing APRO, um, since we are doing the work not in isolation, but doing the work with the organizations within the system. And I'd like to um, recognize the uh, past president of, the, of your academic center, uh, Stacy, uh, is it Millich? 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 Yeah. yeah. Stacy's here. Oh, hi, Stacy. Hi. Um, and then um, this year, leadership, um, Roland um, Brinker, um, the um, Academic Senate President, and Wesley Sims, uh, your uh, Academic Senate uh, Vice President. And um, I know that um, also um, as, uh, important players uh, of, for us to actually be here today uh, include uh, Huey um, Dan, the Director of um, Equity, and Melissa Richardson, your Vice President of uh, uh, Human Resources. So thank you very much uh, for gathering uh, and uh, coming together with us to actually make sure that we prepare uh, a session that uh, would help you uh, think through um, your the, uh, the, way, the ways in which you want to proceed with uh, this work um, at your campus. I um, will be remiss to, if I don't recognize uh, a couple of your leaders that are here today. And um, so Vice President, uh, of instruction, Jason Curtis, and um, Assistant Superintendent, Vice President of Student Services and College uh, Centers, uh, Mark Sanchez. And so thank you for joining us today. So originally, we were going to do introductions because we thought it was gonna be between 29 and 50 folks. <laughs> and so, um, and I believe there's uh, a little bit more um, uh, than that here, and so thank you for making the time on a beautiful Friday morning. Uh, so we decided that unfortunately we'll, we just we won't be able to actually get to the introductions the way we want it, and so um, uh, hopefully we'll get to um, know you and get to uh, get to talk with you as we are actually working through things today. And so I'm going to ask you that when you contribute, uh, particularly in the large group. Uh, please uh, mention your name um, uh, so um, you can be uh, acknowledged. So one of the areas that I think it's important for uh, this discussion um, is uh, that we actually think about some agreements and interaction agreements. I know that if you're like me um, that um, attends um, the uh, EEO training every two years uh, in order for me to be able to uh, be on a hiring committee as a faculty member, or I meal rat. Uh, I um, we there's you know sometimes the there are elements uh, of uh, that we're going to cover today that are not necessarily elements that are included. And the reason why you're going to see a little bit of a difference is because we're really trying to apply an equity lens um, to the work that we are doing. And so applying an equity lens uh, uh, requires that we talk a little bit about uh, interaction agreements. Um, how do we want to be with each other in this space? And so I'm going to ask you um, to um, show up and choose to be present. I know that sometimes the cell phones and other things that are in our mind uh, takes us away from, uh, from uh, being present. So uh, I invite you to uh, choose to be present today. Um, pay attention to what was hard and meaning. And so uh, there are things that we're going to talk about today that may feel funny, um, they may create some discomfort, or uh, they, um, there are things that may also uh, uh, 
celebrate who we are and acknowledge who we are and the great work that we're trying to accomplish as faculty because we are uh, well-meaning uh, folks and but we're in constant learning. Um, tell the truth without blame or judgment and so we want to um, speak your truth. And um, I'm going to ask you today to be open to outcomes, not attached to outcomes. And so let go of your own ideas um, as much as you can and be open to other ideas and, um, and uh, um, uh, around the discussion that we have today. So for this session today, uh, you are, um, we are looking at, We are looking at um, uh, uh, three outcomes. Um, the first outcome is about re-envisioning the EO training to achieve greater diversity. Uh, we also are hoping that we create a com uh, common ground and a unified effort for equity. And uh, remember equity in hiring, that is our, our lens today. And uh, you can see um, the, the things that we want to try to address today. Um, knowing and understanding the district mission, vision, and values for this college, um, open and honest communication um, and dialogue, knowing and understanding our students and employees, um, and, uh, and be able to actually openly uh, address uh, race relationships or race, race relations, and um, move um, leaders and faculty toward cultural shift and equity driven change. The Academic Center for California Community Colleges is actually work, has just approved the paper on equity-driven systems, and we hope that that paper actually uh, sets the tone for the next phase of the work around um, student equity and, in, and institutional equity, uh, which is the area that I believe that uh, many of us throughout the states need to actually spend some time um, in addressing uh, with more intention and, uh, and deliberately. And then we want to apply to an equity lens to the faculty hiring uh, process. So we start uh, this morning by just reminding us um, of the mission of the California Community College System. And um, I was actually, so I don't know how many of you are aware that, um, if you're aware that the uh, Chancellor's Office uh, website has been kind of morphed um, and changed, improved. And so I, um, as, I as we were preparing for this session, I uh, realized that they, there was a simple statement that they're now uh, putting out to us. And, uh, and the vision and the vision is about putting students first. So remember, at the center of our universe are our students. Um, you know that uh, from your experience as faculty and, and as leaders, that you are doing an, uh, a, a very important job of making sure that we have um, the educational uh, programs and learning opportunities that are necessary uh, for our students. That uh, we know that um, uh, putting students first is about contributing to uh, the social capital, the cultural capital of the communities that we're servicing. And so, and then that we uh, provide opportunities for students to develop a set of skills or competencies um, like critical thinking, like quantitative reasoning, and, and so forth. So we also know, um, we also found out, as we are, we're preparing, um, that your mission is a mission that certainly spoke to me uh, as a uh, faculty member. And, um, and this that you see here is your mission statement. And uh, your mission statement, there's a few words highlighted on your mission statement. And I know that this may feel uh, kind of strange, but I'm gonna ask you to read out, to join me, to read out loud your mission statement. So at the count of three. <laughs> One, two, three. An inclusive institution that aspires to the diversity of the population with the clear educational goals. We have equity support students in their efforts to improve foundational skills, earn certificates for associate degrees, transfer to foreign institutions, and advance the workforce.
to be very, very proud of your mission statement. Your mission statement is definitely has um, the components uh, of the work that we're trying to advance. And so uh, it was very meaningful, certainly as a faculty member, to um, read it um, and, uh, and to join your mission. So one dimension um, that your mission statement um, talks about, it's about um, developing, um, uh, shaping um, the lives of our students in, um, in a way that they are, uh, that we are preparing them to be uh, global citizens. And so global citizens uh, require that we prepare our students uh, in a way that they effectively can address uh, the diversity that is around them. And so um, important for us, uh, for us to recognize um, that there, there is a cognitive dimension um, to the idea of being prepared to be a uh, citizen of the world. And that uh, um, we know it's about skills and um, competencies. But we also know that there is that social emotional dimension uh, to developing um, global citizens. And that social emotional dimensions uh, sometimes Gets um, gets a little obscured by by the quantitative by quantitative data because um, we forget the power of uh, qualitative data, and so I want you to be thinking about um, this particular dimension, which this dimension um, allows us to um, develop uh, uh, folks who care, students who care, who, who students who have uh, connection with others, uh, understand about collaboration and um, uh, other kinds of skills that, in fact, are important in, uh, in dealing with each other um, in our world. And I, I do want to uh, bring out uh, or pull out um, a, a couple of the words that are part of the social and emotional dimension, which is about uh, respect and, peaceful, and peacefully. And so we are about um, making sure that our students um, develop um, the, those values uh, around respect and then uh, of course, the skills that are necessary to live in a peaceful world. Um, and uh, we know that now we are encountering a lot, and our students dealing with a lot. And, um, and so it is important that we, we continue to think about um, uh, their lives and how we can contribute to this, their lives and um, their social emotional development. And then the behavioral, which is about uh, content performance and uh, applications um, and uh, practical engagement. And uh, in engagement, we want students to, because we're trying to remember that students are at the center of the work that we do, we want to make sure that, um, that we find ways in which students can be engaged. Um, and students can actually be a part of the creation. So they're like co-creators of, uh, of the work that we do at the colleges, because everything that we do, for the most part, is around them. And so think of uh, the behaviors that are necessary um, to build um, for them to actually co-create with us. <laughs> so at, I had to ask um, the, uh, uh, our, your staff to actually share with us uh, a few quotes about um, students and so I'd like to begin before I talk about the, these questions that you have you see on the screen I'd like to begin um, by actually reading um, a few of those quotes that we received um, so this is from a student um, the opportunity to have a black professor in and itself is so very encouraging since so many people of color are incarcerated it allows for a man to think I can make it too Professor Old um, have, has had a positive influence on me. Because of her and non-judgmental attitude, I am better to thrive in this course. And I'll sh I'll, I am sure I'll, I'll strive, survive, and provide in the years to come. Professor Lobo helped me believe in myself. As at a low time when another professor told me to quit, uh, she encouraged me to keep going. I did, and I am um, graduating. Thank you. All staff at the cafe have been spectacular. They, they, um, re they remember and care about what was going on in my life. And so 
I hope um, that the quotes um, from your students can um, sometimes do this again and be recognized um, as you go uh, with your daily day. Um, those quotes mean a lot to us no? as faculty. Uh, those quotes um, uh, remind us um, why it's important uh, to do the best for each of our students, and particularly um, take us a little further for students that we, um, we, uh, we have noticed and we know that are struggling. So the idea of uh, supporting um, in, a, in a more focused uh, way um, students who are um, dis disproportionately impacted um, is very real. And it's, it's part of the doing, it's part of the call that we have as faculty. And so I, um, I thank you uh, for what you're doing with your students. And I um, was uh, delighted and very moved uh, by some of these quotes um, uh, as a representation of what you do and what is possible. So the role of equity in hiring. So you have a set of questions on the screen. <laughs> I hope you can all see them. This set of questions are questions that we would like you to be thinking about today. Um, because this set of questions are for ourselves to reflect. And so uh, we do, how do we prepare students for the diversity of the world they live in? How can we understand diversity without experiencing it directly? How do we understand our own biases? How do we identify the biases in our processes, in the fabric of our system? How do we eliminate in our biases, um, uh, uh, biases in our behaviors as well as in the system? What are my identities? What influences my identities? And how do I participate in a community with diverse identities? So think about these questions uh, throughout the session. Um, if there is one that uh, calls your attention, uh, write it down. Think it through and bring, bring it into the discussion um, when we uh, engage uh, in the activities that we have prepared for you today. So with that, we are moving um, to a little bit of a data review, since we know that data um, does not drive change, but uh, definitely um, People do, and but it does this tell the story. Um, so Greg is going to help us with the review of that data. Thank you, Myron. I think that framing this around our mission statement is really important because that is what, for me, drives this this necessity for thinking about equity, for thinking about inclusion. If we're going to promise our students the things in that mission statement, which are really big promises to make, if you come here, we are going to transform you in some academically, socially, culturally, and prepare you to go out into the world. And I think about the community where I work and live. If a, if a student growing up there does not venture south of Sacramento, and this happens to a lot of our students, they come into our college, they may have gone down to Sacramento for an athletic event or to go to a, a show or something, but they haven't really experienced it. And they grow up in our area experiencing very, very little racial diversity. They do really well academically, they get accepted to UC Berkeley, and they show up on that campus on day one. <laughs> right? You can imagine this. They are walking into a world they will not understand, and they are going to interact with people who fundamentally have a completely different idea of what sense of self, and family, and faith, and sexuality, and all of these really important things that define who we are. Are they prepared to do that in a way with what we promised, with that global citizen? with somebody who understands that kind of diversity and those questions that we frame, thinking about what goes into my identity, how did I establish it, what does that mean when I interact with somebody with a different identity, can I do that in a healthy and productive way, or am I combative and defensive about my identity? And we know that if students are going to go out and participate in the workforce in a more diverse world, they're going to have to be able to do that successfully. I've got to be able to work beside somebody who has very different values, but we can work together professionally um, very cohesively, and that's hard to learn how to do, right? I think we've all struggled with it at various times. And so we look at then the data on our community here, and you can see that there is a difference as the students look at who are we as a community versus who works at the college. And so here are our students 
54% of the students are white, 52% female. So almost half of our students are of color. But we look at our employee demographic, um, and this is our based on, on gender. The female um, majority exists in everywhere but our tenured faculty. We go on to race and a very different composition. Tenured faculty, 80% white. Remember, compared to 50% for our students. 88% among our part-time faculty. 61% among educational administrators. 71% among our classified staff. And so our students are seeing that, right? They come in and they see. I am reflected more amongst my peers than I am, and we heard in the quote from the student that I love, it was so great to have an African-American instructor. I saw a model for this that defies what was my expectation. He mentioned, the student mentioned car incarceration, right? And where do we get that idea from? It's prevalent in our society. We see it in media. We see it in popular media, and social media. And we hear about these statistics and see it in news coverage. That my expectation when I see an African-American is they're more likely to be a criminal than someone from another race. But when I see that instructor, that changes my dynamic. I have a, a personal interaction with someone now that makes me question that, that assumption that I might make or that stereotype that I see. And so our students are interacting with us differently than they are with themselves. And they're seeing models that reflect some longstanding cultural um, and social patterns that we have. That we go back 70 years and discrimination in employment and in education was legal. I could say I'm hiring a man for this position. I could say um, someone who is Latino or Latina need not apply for this position. And it was totally legal to do that. And I could segregate my school. Those vestiges still live with us in many ways throughout systems that were created out of those areas. So in comparison, you can see in our student population, um, the percentages based on what our employees look like. And there's a distinction there. And so then I think back to those questions think to our mission statement. Are we able to interact with students from a different cultural background in a way that supports their education the same way we would with someone from our own? Can we engage with that student in a way that helps them to better understand diversity in our world and the kinds of things culturally that they're going to experience in the workforce and in their lives when they move beyond this? And how much does the diversity of within our own faculty and staff prepare us to do that for them? And so the comparison between our students and our employee population is not to suggest that if we just got these numbers to be equal, that we would be where we need to be. That idea that there's some kind of magical threshold that that's going to make this work, I don't think exists, and I don't think is accurate. What is accurate is that all of our, our faculty and staff are going to be interacting with students from different cultural backgrounds than, them, than they have. And can they do that successfully? Can they do that in a way that our students um, achieve the same success and the same outcome. And when we think about hiring, then that gets to the skill set we want to make sure is embedded into everything we're doing. It's not just your technical knowledge or your knowledge of the discipline, but how do you apply it? How well can you pass that on to um, your students? So one of the um, one of the areas that I think it's uh, really important um, to think about continue to think about is uh, the fact that um, uh, as we put students first or as we focus on our students, um, we want to make sure that we um, further our understanding of what um, uh, the, this EEO world is about um, uh, uh, and the relationship to equity um, and, uh, in our hiring processes. And so a long time ago, a few uh, colleges from Northern California work with California tomorrow. And um, I, uh, and this is probably about 10 to 12 years ago, if not a little more. And one of the, um, one of the tools that they developed together was actually a, uh, a rubric for how you get to uh, develop an equity-driven system. So these colleges um, that in the Bay Area um, were actually at the forefront of trying to uh, change uh, the narrative um, particularly around uh, student outcomes and felt very strongly that they needed to be looking at 
uh, equity in hiring. And, uh, and so from this, uh, the, the rubric and the report that they, um, that they published a long time ago, and some folks don't like to refer reference anymore because it's kind of an old document, um, but, um, uh, and we have a lot, a lot of other writings and a lot of other um, resources at, the, at our hands, right, at our fingertips right now. But one of the things, um, a couple of, uh, of um, concepts that uh, spoke with me as I was actually engaged uh, over this last year and a half with the State Academic Senate and trying to advance this work was the concept of uh, stru uh, structural dimension and uh, cultural dimension. That in the hiring process, there's these two dimensions that we need to be attentive to. And, um, the, uh, the, the uh, dimensions, these two dimensions uh, actually are grounded in the five principles of equity-minded, um, the five equity-minded principles. And so um, if uh, you've uh, read and had an opportunity to take a look at the uh, leadership that the Center for Urban Education that has provided, has provided to us, um, Dr. Stella Benzimon, and uh, lots of others, um, certainly throughout the state, uh, we are asked to think about these five principles um, when we are looking at our hiring uh, process, uh, policies, procedures, and, and processes, um, as well as our practices. And so to be race conscious, and yes, we call out race, because we call out race because that is the uh, a, a area in which we have been most challenged in our system. And um, that, that we are systematically aware that there is uh, uh, barriers and something rooted in our systems uh, that uh, prevent us from moving forward. Um, that we stay institutionally focused and we spend time taking a look at our work institutionally. What, what is it from our practices in, in student development or in student services? Um, uh, what is it from our practices in, um, in a faculty hiring um, that are in fact uh, uh, keep barriers um, that that get in the way of uh, diversifying our faculty. And that uh, we maintain state evidence base, and you saw the quantitative data. Is your data, you, I'm sure you know this data, because uh, I, I reviewed a number of documents, and we reviewed also um, uh, other EEO uh, presentations that have been done, and you've been talking about this data. And so keep talking about this data, and then please add the qualitative data, because the qualitative data adds to that story. And there's something that, when we did do qualitative data analysis, there's something that happens inside of us that touches the heart. Um, it, it gives an, another layer of meaning that's also important. And then we are about equity advancing. So equity advancing means how do we sustain the equity work? It's not that we got some money, we do some work for a little bit, and done. The equity money is gone, which, which we know it's not, it's combined now, but um, nevertheless, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the idea is that we need to sustain this work. And though this work is a journey. Being equity-minded is also a personal journey, as well as a uh, journey uh, for us as an institution. So, the, um, these are um, the dimensions that I learned, um, the structural dimensions uh, about aligning hiring processes with institutional goals. Always go back to those. And so, um, and when we're looking at that, we're looking at how culturally responsive and representative are our faculty, our staff, our employees, um, according to uh, the population of students that we serve. Uh, what are we doing in our classrooms to actually lift um, that uh, cultural responsiveness and, uh, um, and uh, pedagogy or andragogy? We also, another um, uh, structural dimension is uh, uh, reflecting on hiring processes, which is what we're here um, to really think about today. And so um, understand uh, what are the priorities and what are our objectives? for the hiring of a uh, faculty member at a particular uh, department, a particular discipline. So what are the priorities for that department? What are the priorities for that discipline? How does those priorities match with uh, the populations of students that we are serving? And are we able to actually attract candidate, 
uh, a uh, representative pool that of diverse candidates. The other dimension is um, the uh, cultural uh, dimension. And in the cultural dimension, uh, it's about basically taking a look at the um, populations that have been uh, struggling um, uh, are, and are trying to achieve um, in our system, uh, certainly at your school. And then, so what are we doing about, um, about that hiring criteria that in fact keep it, keeps in mind um, that, partic the popula that particular population that we're trying to serve, and a particular population that we're trying to advance because we see um, little or no movement. And it is about achieving racial and ethnic diversity. Uh, and it is, uh, again, as it was mentioned through the stories or the quotes, as well as what Greg mentioned, it is uh, about us being more uh, open uh, to understanding that uh, the, the uh, uh, outcome of uh, achieving um, uh, diverse faculty, uh, but particularly that uh, racial diverse faculty, is part of what we're trying to achieve when we actually work on uh, racial equity. And then the last piece of um, is the cultural, the cultural dimension is about the representation of the hiring committees. I don't know about you, but in my college, um, sometimes we're challenged. Um, we're challenged to who's applying to be in the hiring committee because we have through the Senate an application process. And uh, um, sometimes when we look at that application, the applications, uh, we don't see in the applications the uh, diversity that we need and certainly not sometimes not see the diversity, the racial diversity that we need to see um, in um, the composition of the, uh, of the uh, uh, committee. And so what do we do um, about that? So how do we engage a faculty, um, diverse faculty, faculty um, uh, of, uh, representative of various ethnic or racial groups into um, the hiring committees? And so that's a hard question uh, because, you know, remember, and you, you know this, you know, it's so nice to just have people that are like-minded, look like me, think like me. I can work with them and we can make this hiring committee, blah, you know, easy work. Um, it doesn't work that way because the world right now is asking us um, that uh, we actually think carefully um, about representation. And, uh, and that representation that candidates can actually also see that, because that you know, opens another um, world um, in, in, uh, in itself, uh, even for the candidates when uh, they apply and they go to interview processes. So um, doing um, more around uh, the selection of uh, the hiring committee members, uh, it's critical uh, to this work. Now we get to um, the part of this presentation where we may touch on the more complicated subject. And we've got to acknowledge bias, implicit and explicit. We're going to talk about both here. Um, but if we take bias and use a more uh, positive sounding word, it becomes preference, right? And we all have these. I am playing on a cultural bias that the majority of us participate in right now by presenting to you my competence in the way I dress. You see me dress this way, and people, when I ask this in trainings, what do you assume? I hear professional, important, competent, things like this, because we've been taught this, right? I wasn't born and looked out and said, oh, there's somebody in a suit, they must be really good at their job. But I have learned over the years. And then I took it another step. You don't accidentally buy a tie this bright pink, right? And so I signal to you a level of confidence and the ability to wear it. And all of these things you're receiving visually and you're making assumptions about me. Now, it could be I'm not terrible at my job. Um, I am completely um, afraid of my own sexuality and don't know how to express it. But that's not the message you receive. And I know when I put it on what I was doing. If I showed up in sweats today, you'd be looking at me differently from right now. Um, and this happens in a number of different ways, the way we form these biases and these preferences. And then they embed themselves into our decision making. Somebody comes in for an interview. Well, they didn't make eye contact. They didn't shake my hand. They didn't speak loudly and confidently. I'm going to then infer from all of that some level of incompetence, or they're not the best candidate. 
None of that had anything to do with perhaps their actual ability to perform our job, but it's a really easy shortcut for them. And so we want to think about these things in terms of how they manifest around who, what groups we associate with, and we will assume positive, and what groups we do not, and we will then assume negative, starting with thinking about implicit biases. And to do this, we want to bring in somebody who's done a lot more research than I have and understands it at a far greater depth and show a, a brief video for you to kind of set the stage for us. Before we actually um, uh, go into the video, uh, I did want to just uh, mention because, uh, you know, I've learned to be courageous and uh, sometimes to be, to be able to uh, say, uh, speak the truth, you know? And so you see um, in front of you a uh, Latina um, with an accent and um, uh, a, a, a person that, you know, may seem a little nervous, which I am, by the way. I'm always, I always get nervous with my peers. And so, um, and then you see Greg. And so I know that for some of us, that might have brought a bias into this space. And we're aware of that. But it's uh, becoming aware of that bias in that moment. Instead of acting on the bias, but actually reflecting on the bias before we act. And so I just wanted to mention that um, because oftentimes um, I am in that kind of a situation, um, particularly uh, because there are some folks that have a difficult time with accents, no? And so accents are not necessarily seen as a positive um, um, for, for um, some folks. And again, the bias uh, comes around that particular uh, part of, of a person. And so just wanted to share that with you so that you know we're open books, no? I'm an open book. I, this work is, has led me um, to believe um, that I can actually um, share with you, um, speak, uh, speak my, um, the truth, and, uh, and, uh, and feel okay about it. And so um, I, hope I, I, I hope you're okay with, with, with it too. Let's look at how to measure bias in ourselves and in others. Here's Dolly Chug from NYU. We sent emails to real professors in real universities. They contacted over 6,500 professors at random from 260 American universities. We sent them an email that looked like it came from a real person asking for a meeting to learn more about the PhD program in that university. But we randomly assigned whether the, the fictional person sending that email had a name that sounded male or female and sounded white, Chinese, Hispanic, Indian, or black. What we found that is if you were a white male, you were far more likely to receive a response back than if you were in all those other categories put together as a group. Some of this could be explicit racism, but it's far more likely that in many cases, these professors are just busy. They can't respond to every email they get. So they kind of let their subconscious decide for them. And that's where their biases come through. Research shows that our racial biases are often more about who we choose to help than who we don't. And we tend to help people who are similar to us. But you aren't 6,500 randomly selected professors. So how can you figure out where you might be making similar unconscious choices? First, there's a well-known test online you can take that can help show you biases you hold. Or just do an audit. Whatever data you have, whether it's formal data in a computer or whether it's just data that's sort of anecdotal, look at the data. For example, I met this fantastic executive in Silicon Valley. He takes great pride in being someone who actively tries to achieve gender balance on his teams, knowing that Silicon Valley and tech are skewed heavily male. So he looked at his professional social network, his Twitter, his LinkedIn. He found his network was far more skewed male than he expected. So there is a place where he could actively work to shift that, and that's what he's been doing since then. So this is not a scientifically exact self-audit, but it can still be useful. And you can audit anything. So maybe start by taking that online test for bias. Maybe check out whose emails you're replying to. But you can also audit yourself for implicit bias by asking a friend to observe you in the real world. If you're a teacher, have people look at who you call on most in class whatever your interactions are. One practical thing that people should do is take stock of their friends. 
it would be very useful for people to actually make lists of people with whom they spend time. Look for patterns. That's the audit. That's the assessment we can all do. So as we think about that, the important revelation for me there was it's more about who we choose to help than thinking negatively about another group. And that was an enlightening moment for me because I hadn't thought about it through that context before I saw this research presented. Who I choose to help, who I choose to engage with proactively, which then set me back to reflect on my own experiences in many different capacities. But I thought about the things that people did to signal to me that I was welcome in whatever space I was in, that I was encouraged, that they made some effort to let me know that it was okay to engage. And then, did they do that for others? And then I thought about my own actions. How much do I do things that signal to people that already think like me, that have the same cultural background that I do, versus what proactive efforts do I make to engage someone from a different cultural background, to let them know that you are welcome and accepted and encouraged to participate here. And that's part of what I think that research is showing us, is that people are responsive to requests when there's something that they can identify with. This is a person that somehow I can identify with. But they were less likely to be responsive when they didn't immediate, immediately see that connection. And so then we think about where does that come from? Why would that um, happen? Is it something we're just intrinsically born with? Or is it part of social conditioning? And I would argue, without a lot of research and purely anecdotally, that there is a lot of social conditioning that happens with that. And so what we see here is just images from popular culture. Images that I look at and am not immediately surprised by or confused about in any way. They're so prevalent in my background and upbringing. And so up here on the right, many of you probably recognize Breaking Bad, a very popular show. But the image of a Latino male with a gun in his hand, threatening the white male with the suit, is not something that I'm surprised to see. I have seen many images where Latino males have been portrayed as aggressive, violent, criminal in their behavior. And if you know the show, you know that this man is just as much of a criminal, if not more, than this man is. But in the portrayal of the show, both this character, Saul Goodman, and the main protagonist, Walter White, they come into their criminality in a very different kind of way. And I'm made to be sympathetic with them in the way that story is told. By the end of the show, I feel bad for Walter. Here's a man who decided to become a drug kingpin and has killed many, many people in many violent ways. This character does not get portrayed in a way that I should care about his background, how he arrived at this point, or why he has turned to this form of behavior at all. His background isn't important in the show. And that happens all the time, to the point that I don't even notice it unless I actually stop and consciously think about it. More portrayals of Latinas in this kind of violent culture where we just skip past how they got there and go straight to the fact that they're incarcerated. Latinas also get portrayed often in a caretaker domestic role, the housemaid, so much so popular that there's an entire new show that has been celebrated for having an all Latina cast, but it's called Devious Maids. And what kind of thing is being sold to me with that? How do I think of a Latina, male, a Latina when I meet her? When I meet Myra and she talked about the immediate things she's thinking about. Do people hear my accent? They see my race and my sex and think something of me. Well, what have I interacted with in culture that would give me something to think about as soon as I meet Myra? And of course, Myra defies all of these stereotypes in every kind of way, being a highly educated, successful Latina. Going back to my early days watching cartoons, the representation of Hispanic culture, Mexican culture, Latin American culture, we have some very clear signs that fit in elsewhere. And so I can very easily identify who those characters are and then what are their roles within those shows. How often do I have to see those cartoons before that becomes my understanding of someone who looks that way? When I see someone who has a darker skin tone than mine, these are the reference points I have. The spicy, sexy Latina female, a very popular culture in a lot of our movies and television would we ever see the reverse of this image? Would we see the elderly Latina who is successful in her career married to a young, attractive, spicy, sexy white man? 
I couldn't find a show that had that to put it up. <laughs> if you know of it, I'd love, I'd love to hear about it. But this happens in so many ways, and we see it in the coverage of our news as well. We see images when there is a story about you know, breaking news, uh, police are looking for a suspect in a robbery, and that's a person of color. We often see a mugshot or a picture that doesn't portray them favorably. But when a white person goes and shoots people in a church, we get a photo of them as a child with a headline about you know, internet evil. Or when a young man goes to Stanford and rapes a woman, we get a picture of his yearbook photo. And I would just think, what? Well, this looks like an upstanding young man. Somewhere along the way, something happened to him. He is as much a victim in this, and there's something else going on. That's the kind of thing that immediately happens for me. And I can identify with that person when I see him, because of the way he's portrayed. But people of color don't get portrayed that way, and I see something other than me. That's not me I see reflected up there. Clearly, there's something wrong with them, and that must be a problem. These images matter because it starts to create these connections in my brain. And so when I think about who can I relate to, all of this history, I have to grapple with consciously. Because if I don't consciously grapple with it, it's way too likely that these kinds of portrayals are gonna be what's stuck in my mind. There was a study done about the representation of immigrants, specifically. And of course, this is a really big topic for us right now politically. And in in our television and, and uh, film and media coverage, when there is a Latinx person portrayed as an immigrant, they're also portrayed as a criminal 50% of the time. But if they're of a European white background, only 9%. And these are portrayals, and these are not stories of actual people who have done things. These are just the way they're presented to us in film, in popular culture, television. Far more likely to make this association. And we see that reflected in our politics and our discussion, right? The idea of people coming across our southern border to bring crime and all of these negative things to our culture. But people that come from our eastern seaboard, they're good upstanding people that are going to contribute to our strong American values and hard work and these kinds of things that I can immediately identify with. Is this reflective of reality? Absolutely not. But it becomes my understanding of it. So when I hear that someone is an immigrant, and I see that they have brown skin, what do I immediately think? Probably potential criminal. And so we've got to think about how things are presented to us. What is the portrayals that we're receiving, our students are receiving, and then how are we going to consciously and actively interact with that? Because the impact is that it perpetuates negative opinions. And so I think back on my education and a time where sitting in the same classroom teacher asked me a question, and when I hesitated, he said, take a moment, think about this. I know you can reason through it. And it was a very encouraging statement, right? Okay, I don't have the answer immediately, but I can do this. And another person in the classroom, a young African-American male, when he asked the question, there was hesitation. It was, I know this one's tough. We can come back to it. And almost immediately dismissed his ability. Now, I didn't really think about that in the moment that it happened. But when I see data like this, and when I started to understand these things, it became clear to me. That student was sitting in a different classroom than I was. I was receiving a level of encouragement that he wasn't getting. My success in that classroom probably has as much to do with that encouragement as it did with anything I brought in. It wasn't that I was really smarter than that person, but I was receiving a level of engagement and encouragement that he wasn't. And we were sitting in two different classrooms. <coughs> so those stereotypes that get portrayed become things that we start to believe in if we don't have direct interaction to counter that. And that's the conflict. As soon as we do, once we do interact with that person who combats those stereotypes, it starts to change our brain. And the process probably sounds unfortunate for many of us when we do it. When I say us, I mean specifically people that look like me, where it's like, wow, that person's really smart for a, insert some cultural identity that I've just completely you know, taken away any of their empowerment and said they are all this negative characteristic, except this one exemplar. And then I meet a few more, and a few more, and a few more, and pretty soon they can't all be the exception to the rule. Maybe my rule is wrong. That's a very difficult process to go through. It requires a lot of self-reflection. It's hard. It's hard work. So, um, so this moves us to um, to think about uh, a very important part of equity work um, uh, and being and, being, and developing um, equity mindedness. 
is about um, making sure that we have a common language and that we're speaking to that common language. And so um, I know that we failed at the beginning um, to mention you have a packet that you picked up. Uh, the packet has um, the, uh, your commitment to diversity, and so we wanted to make sure that you know you have that since this is your your commitment to diversity. And then there is actually a handout with a few of the activities that we're going to be uh, working through today. And um, and so I wanted to uh, make sure that. Uh, if you want to follow along, um, it's the second page, um, the one that we will be um, looking at. Uh, slide 22, we number the slides uh, on the on the handout. Um, and so I wanted to um, uh, uh, make sure that, I think we wanted to make sure that um, as, uh, as we think about um, the um, equity in the hiring process, that we are understanding the words that we're actually using and that we understand what they mean. And um, some of the, um, some of the, um, the uh, definitions that you have in the handout are uh, basically definitions um, that are um, generally um, used um, to describe uh, equity, um, diversity, and inclusion. And um, since a lot of the work around equity and diversity and inclusion uh, leads to also uh, social justice, we wanted to make sure that we included that um, and that you take a look at that in the language that you adopt uh, as, a, as an institution, as a college. And so equity, um, diversity, inclusion, and social justice. Um, this is the language of, um, of, of equity-driven um, uh, systems. When we look at um, equity, um, we, um, you, I mean, you can read the definitions there. I don't think I want to spend time in actually going through them, uh, but we're going to ask you to do something, though. Um, so I'm, we're going to ask you to think about your mission and the values of your institution, just for a moment. And so how, are, how is this language, how is the language of equity, diversity, and social inclusion and social justice reflected in that mission. So I'm gonna take us back for a moment to the mission statement. So again, how is equity, diversity, inclusion, and social justice reflected in your mission? about your values, too. Thoughts? Uh, I think that a lot of you have been language. You have a great highlighted language up there, but um, the phrase that spoke to me was the enhancing lives by promoting cultural, personal, um, and professional growth. And I think the idea of um, cultural competency and personal and professional growth is all about um, learning to, as you put it, um, interact peacefully and respectfully and um, with understanding that we all come from a different place and all sort of want the same thing. Thank you. Stacy. Other thoughts? Is there something missing from your mission statement? Is there language missing? So we're not answering the question for you, because this is going to be <laughs> part of your work. Um, so um, oftentimes when we visited colleges this year and a half, uh, colleges, that's one of the first questions that come up, is uh, how do we get into this uh, equity, um, uh, uh, equity in hiring work if we don't really know what equity, uh, diversity, inclusion, social justice means? 
equity-mindedness or being equity-minded means. And so it's really important that members of the institution, every one of you as member of this familia and this college, that we have that common language uh, in order for us to uh, be um, uh, effective at, uh, to you know, what we need to uh, do to improve um, in terms of our, uh, our policy, uh, processes, and procedures, or and practices. So um, I, we had an opportunity to take a look at your EEO plan, um, and uh, uh, it was actually um, great reading um, for uh, the different uh, perspectives and the different um, components and methodologies that you're utilizing. And so I wanted to, we wanted to highlight um, those uh, particular areas. Um, so uh, your component A um, talks about the training for screening and selection committee, and in that training, uh, you are, uh, you have um, uh, stated that uh, it's not about just uh, what is required by law, but that you're also going to be uh, looking at a training that includes uh, the ed educational benefits of a workforce uh, diversity. And that you're going to also um, uh, uh, train and include in those trainings a topic that we just talked about, uh, implicit bias and be able to actually think about how to recognize and hopefully eliminate um, some of the biases that are part of hiring decision making. And, uh, and, and certainly, again, the best practices on serving on a selection or screening committee um, and hopefully diversity uh, would actually be the focus of uh, that selection process. And um, your component number 12 speaks to the institutional commitment to diversity. So you have to be very proud that you have worked through a number of very important body of work um, that, um, that actually lifts um, diversity in all sorts of different ways, not just through your mission statement, not just through the commitment statement that the board adopted uh, recently, um, but your education master plan, your um, EEO plan, and so now that we have all that rich recognition that is part of your, um, your work, um, so what do we do um, to continue to be in that journey that we include, um, that we actually do better as we think about uh, representation? So this is the area that we oftentimes um, look at carefully and we do a relatively uh, a good job in making sure that we know that uh, federal and state laws uh, prohibit us from discriminating uh, in, this, in, the, in this basis here on this list. And so um, reminding ourselves of that and then reminding ourselves also, so what does that mean um, you know, when we are uh, applying um, this that we're required to do by law, um, how, how are we applying that understanding? Is that understanding uh, being applied to advance diversity, or is that understanding uh, uh, is applied to actually uh, created barriers um, for uh, candidates or in the process? And so it is important that we reflect upon that um, because uh, we know that sometimes that uh, can be very challenging um, based on um, uh, our conversations, our dialogues, and whatever happens in those hiring committees. And uh, it is important that we recognize that we do have a responsibility um, to uh, not discriminate um, against any of these uh, uh, statutes that you see here. And so, so discrimination is um, defined and you know, redefined. I, I like to think about it from actually the redefinition uh, way. Um, or, um, it's about making sure that we are, um, we're, we are 
aware how our biases are going to uh, impact um, the uh, outcomes uh, around hiring. And so, um, and I know that um, Greg already mentioned this, just one more way of stressing it, um, because that is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's key to the work that we're trying to advance. And then uh, we, we want to make sure that um, we are understanding what practice, policy or practice, neutral policy or practice, uh, result, results in that disproportionate negative outcome of a particular class. And so we ought to be um, at the table uh, holding what we call, now it's become a, kind of a, a very important word for many of us, as courageous dialogues, no? um, that are dialogues that will allow us to get to that place um, where we want to go, but we got to have them. And um, we also want to make sure um, that we are, um, as we are trained to be EEO, and by the way, I come from an ins institution that uh, for a period of time, over the last uh, five years, uh, many of us uh, were actually trained as EEOs, uh, and we serve in committees like if we, each of us would be an EEO, a representative. So it's not just the responsibility of one person in the committee, but it's actually the collective responsibility. And so when we are um, um, looking at um, how we ensure EEO, we, it's about being proactive, being able to have beyond the training that we receive at the conversation, at the um, time to um, uh, discuss questions, wonders, inquiries, um, applying um, equity lenses uh, with you know, rubrics or tools that you may have um, that actually um, help you do so. And um, we have to make uh, sure that um, we, co we continue to talk about the difference between these two. So lots of times um, uh, we are in situations where folks may be, may have a different perspective around the meaning of equality versus equity. We would like you to clear that perspective and be clear on your definition of equality and clear on your definition of equity. And so as you can see, <coughs> equity is about everyone gets the same. Outcomes are the result of the individual efforts. When we're talking about equity, it's about everybody does not get the same. Because even though we have similarities amongst all of us, there's also differences. And the differences are in many, in many areas. No? They come from our culture, our gender, our ways of thinking, and so forth. And so we want you to think about um, uh, the uh, meaning of equity uh, in a deeper way by thinking about the categories that we talk about around when we talk about equity. So you have on the second bullet um, a few more of those. So it's not that everything about equity is about race, because this is another area that I get quite often uh, from folks. Why does it have to be about race all the time? It's not about race all the time. Right now, we're focusing on race because that is, we're being challenged. And the data across the state uh, speaks um, to that. But it is also about all the other areas and aspects around um, diversity that are important. Um, institutions and policies that have created, um, have been created by uh, people in majority groups. And so let's begin to place the story of uh, people um, that represent other cultures, other races, other backgrounds, and how are those stories uh, uh, um, heard so they, they can help us uh, figure out how to change uh, policies and rules. And then um, uh, the idea is uh, to uh, remember, uh, remember, remind ourselves that this is an uh, ongoing conscious <coughs> effort. Again, equity is a journey, not a destination. 
So how do we get ourselves in this journey? Um, so we constantly are reflecting, looking for answers, looking for uh, resources, um, act, uh, activating the network of support that we have, um, just like we've activated the Academic Center to be here uh, with Greg today. And so those are very important, and I applaud you for doing that. Before we jump into the next example, uh, that definition of equity versus equality I think is really important to acknowledge. And my current favorite, exa favorite example of how this happens, where just structurally, the things that we accept to be normal um, reflect the biases of one group over another. If you're not aware, earlier this year, back in January, the legislature in California passed a law, all public agencies now have to provide lactation space for new mothers. And I ask you, if the history of our country had been not that white men have been the dominant feature of entrepreneurs, executive boards, executives, managers, but it had been women, would we need a law that said you have to provide lactation space? Probably not. They would have thought of this a long time ago, right? We've thought of the things that I need. I don't need a lot of laws to provide things that I fundamentally need because people just did it. They're already there. I don't even notice them. I walk in and it's very comfortable for me. But people that do not look like me do not have that same experience because the, the, the playing field is not equal. So this idea that I can be colorblind or that if I just treat everyone the same that I'm doing the right thing, I don't think is healthy because it ignores very real differences. You have not walked through the same world I have. And we have to acknowledge and talk about that and think about the way these things happen. As we transition to the next part of our presentation, which is going to be a lot more exercise-based, we're going to start to dive into the actual procedures that you're using and hire people. I want to set this up by giving an example. This TED Talk that I'm going to show you a clip from really has nothing to do with equity and hiring or public education. It just so happens that the, author or the speaker tells a fantastic story about going to a community college that I think illustrates exactly why this is the kind of thing that when we're hiring somebody, what are we hiring for? And so I'm going to show the example and then we'll have a conversation about that. My father was struggling with his own things for most of my life. If you really want to know the truth, the only reason I got into art is because of a woman. There was this amazing, amazing, fantastic, beautiful, smart woman, four years older than me, and I wanted to go out with her. But she said, you're too young, and you're not thinking about your future. So I ran on down to the junior college, registered for some classes, <laughs> ran on back, and basically was like, I'm thinking about my future now. <laughs> can, can, can we go out? <laughs> for the record, She's even more amazing. I married her. <laughs> so when I randomly ran down to the junior college and registered for classes, I really wasn't paying attention to what I was registering to. <laughs> so I ended up with an art history class, and I didn't know a thing about art history. But something amazing happened when I went into that class. For the first time in my academic career, my visual intelligence was required of me. For the first time. The professor would put up an image, bold strokes of blues and yellows, and say, who's that? And I go, that's Van Gogh. Clearly, that is Van Gogh. I got this. <laughs> I got a B in that class. <laughs> For me, that was amazing. In high school, Let's just say I wasn't a great student, okay? In high school, my GPA was 0.65. <laughs> Decimal point first, <laughs> six, five. So me getting a B was huge, <laughs> huge, absolutely huge. And because of the fact that I realized that I was able to learn things visually that I couldn't learn in other ways, this became my strategy, this became my tactic for understanding everything else. 
I wanted to stay in this relationship. Things were going well. I decided, let me keep taking these art history classes. One of the last art history classes I will not forget. I'll never forget. It was one of those survey art history classes. Anybody ever have one of those survey art history classes, where they try to teach you the entire history of art in a single semester? I'm talking about cave paintings and Jackson Pollock. Like just crunched together all in the same. It doesn't really work, but they try anyway. Well, at the beginning of the semester, I looked at the book, and in this 400-page book was about a 14-page section that was on black people in painting. Now, this was a crammed-in section that had representations of black people in painting and black people who painted. It, it was poorly curated. Let's, let's, let's just put it that way. Nonetheless, I was really excited about it, because in all the other classes that I had, we didn't even have that conversation. We didn't talk about it at all. So imagine my surprise when I get to class, and on the day that we're supposed to go over that particular chapter, my professor announces. We're going to skip this chapter today because we do not have time to go through it. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I'm sorry. Hold on, professor. Professor, I'm sorry. This is a really important chapter to me. Are we going to go over it at any point, Titus? We don't have time for this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please, I really need to understand. It clearly the author thinks that this is significant. Why are we skipping over this, Titus? I do not have time for this. Okay, last question. I'm really sorry here. Um, when can we talk? Because we need to talk. <laughs> I went to her office hours. I ended up getting kicked out of her office. I went to the dean. The dean finally told me I can't force her to teach anything. And I knew in that moment, if I wanted to understand this history, if I wanted to understand the roles of those folks who had to walk, I was probably going to have to figure that out myself. But first, you see a plug for guided pathways in there. When I ran down the college, I wasn't paying attention to what I registered. But the story that ends up getting told, and, and let me acknowledge that there's a lot of context of that interaction we do not know, and so we can't really form any judgments about the specific interaction. But if we just take at face value the story that gets told, a student who struggled with the K-12 system for whatever reason, the connection never happened, comes to a community college and has that moment, that breakthrough. I understand now a way that I can learn, I can engage with this. It's excited. Find some passion. I mean, that's what we're all here for, right?、And、certainly, it's what brought me to this—to be part of that, even though I'm not in the classroom. And they get into the subject, and when do they see themselves? In one of the last classes they took, in a very small section. And let's acknowledge the phrase: "I do not have time for that." What does that actually mean? It's not important. It's not important enough. I have 24 hours in every single day, and my seconds last the same amount of time. Every It's just a really polite way to say this doesn't rise in my level of priorities. There's other things we need to get to, and that's the message the student got. And he tried to object, he tried to advocate for himself in that moment. And as he tells the story, it was shut down. And so I think about in my role as the Title IX coordinator, human resources, interacting with people. How would I handle a moment like that? Someone comes to me and says, "Here's my moment of engagement in a way that's culturally relevant to me. Am I going to recognize this as an opportunity?" And sees that opportunity. I think about our instructors on campus. How would they, in that moment, and that's what I would argue we're hiring for. We want to understand through reading your resume, your CV, or whatever we look at, talking to you in the interview, the questions we ask. I want to get a sense of what happens in that moment. Do you engage with the student in a way that leads to them having a connection with their college and their community that feels like I'm being validated? My culture is. My story matters, or do they get a message that look, there is this other thing that's more important than who you are, where you come from, that you need to learn in order to be you know, academically competent in this area. And so, as we go through the next set of exercises, I would encourage you to think about that interaction and how can we hire them? Because ultimately, what it leads to is this: that interaction becomes part of. This fence, this barrier, his ability to participate and engage and be reflected in his, his curriculum it became a barrier to him. in the textbook itself, in the way that it was done, and in the way that the interaction happened with the instructor and the dean. 
And so the next way we think about that is, okay, well, the person could have done something differently to structurally allow him to engage. And that's where we see these assistants. And we do this in a lot of different ways for students in other contexts. We have a lot of programs to help students um, from lower socioeconomic status, students who've been incarcerated, students with disabilities. We have to do a lot of things to help them be able to participate. It's all about providing a resource that somebody else doesn't have. But if we hired someone who was thinking about this before that student ever walked into the classroom, instead of having to provide some additional support, something extra, let me create an independent study program so that you can dive more deeper into the history of blacks and art and black artists. Instead, I'm going to embed that conversation into the curriculum I teach everyone because it's important for my white students to hear it, my Latinx students, my Asian students, my Native American, all of my students who participate need to understand that culture gets reflected in art in ways that are really significant. And that's going to be a fundamental part of what we talk about. Then we end up here, where I don't need to think about the individual differences anymore, because everybody's able now to engage the material. So that is the framework. We want to focus on the second minimum qualification. And that phrasing is a bit unfortunate, because it gives it what sounds like less importance. The minimum qualification that we predominantly hire for for faculty at my campus is confidence in the we need to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how much do you know about math before we have to teach this. We spend a lot less time thinking about how well are you going to interact with people from different cultural backgrounds than your own as you teach it. And the idea that I grapple with is I can know everything there is to know about this. I can be this generation of Thomas Edison. I, um, I can be this generation's Isaac Newton. But if I can't interact with you in a way that actually shares that knowledge, what value does that knowledge have? It's the same as if I didn't have it. So this becomes a really important qualification when we think about who we serve, going back to our data. 80% of our um, staff and faculty, near 80%, are white. Over 48% of our students are people of color. Is that happening? And who are we hiring? And can they bridge that gap? Can they interact with that student population? And so as we think about then, how can we do the next exercise from this framework, making this an important part of everything that we're doing throughout our hiring process, starting with what's in their job application material, and what are we looking for, and what can we find in it? So um, um, on your packet, uh, or in your packet, you have um, on the, the um, I think it's the second page of the back of that first page that has the logo Sorry that we didn't number them. Um, there is a, uh, it says slide 30, it's title, measuring the second minimum qualification. So here's what we'd like you to do. Uh, for a few minutes, uh, we would like you to uh, uh, pair and share. And in your pair and share, um, you're going to discuss the following questions. Uh, if you notice, uh, on, above uh, the pair and share, you have what we have been utilizing um, as a, sta a statement um, of, uh, uh, that uh, it relates to that second minimum qualification. And so we would like you to discuss um, why is this an important minimum qualification? What does this statement look like in practice? Um, how is your screening committee uh, determining that a candidate possess um, this qualification and reinforces its significance? And then how would you exceed a compliance? And so you're going to have just a few minutes for um, conversation um, with an elbow partner. And so um, go for it. Okay. So I'd like you to wrap up your thoughts. I would like uh, to invite you uh, to share with us uh, some of your discussion. And so we're looking for those of you that um, after the first ones. <laughs>
talked about several things in our group, but mostly about question three. And then at the very end, he brought up the idea that this is a really advanced job interview question or concept to ask an applicant for a position. And I've been teaching for almost 20 years, and I don't have an answer for the question I can be asked, like how are you a culturally competent teacher in chemistry? I don't have that answer to think about for like a year or two. And I would have failed that interview question for 20 straight years if this was the question in a job interview. Uh, it's a really important question. I just don't know how we go about screening applicants to see if they actually have this knowledge or skill. Uh, and thank you for the honesty on that. That's, that's not an easy thing to say publicly with your peers. Um, hi, I'm Denise Chelson, um, Mathematics Division Chair. And last year we went through hiring and um, we redid a lot what we did in math, although now seeing more of your information, I would suggest we'd redo a lot more. <laughs> um, but one of the additions we had requirement for candidates that I think was extremely impactful in who we chose and selected to come interview was a philosophy and teaching statement, which is not really an original idea. Um, I'm sure there's other disciplines here who have done that before. We've never done that. And that really, really made it stand out with candidates who looked at students holistically, who didn't just think, how am I teaching math concepts? They, and you could really tell those who went above and beyond and um, actually purposefully threaded uh, this sensitivity into their teaching. And um, I think that really spoke to how we selected candidates. It really, it made an impact. I would highly recommend it if people are doing that. Hi, I'm Neil Higgins with Business and uh, Education. Business Education. Anyway, we were we kind of jumped ahead a little in thinking about how can we get to this information. And we agree with Greg, it's really difficult. And um, the idea, we jumped ahead to the job application and the information of the posting that is in this packet. And we've always had a diversity statement that someone has to fill out that we read in the screening process, but it tends to just be the same basic thing, and I break my own, I think I've applied eight times here, so it's always the same thing. But if we turn that into a scenario-based situation to get information ahead of time, I think it may be beneficial. Thank you. Other thoughts? from our other side? Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Um, so, as you can see, um, certainly from the comments, uh, thank you for contributing um, your thoughts and for contributing what you were actually working and trying to uh, work through. Uh, it is uh, very important that we actually ask ourselves these questions. And these are questions that can be posed um, to the members of the hiring committee as you are convening to determine how are you going to be looking at this particular um, uh, minimum qualification. This minimum qualification should be as important as the competence in the discipline. So what has what's happening now, it's mostly 10% uh, is the competency, it's about demonstrating the competency in the discipline, in, and uh, um, about uh, actually 90%, not 10%, and then 10% is actually the, uh, the what we what we do with this particular statement and with this particular um, uh, write-up. Um, in some organizations, in some campuses, it's a question very a very simple question. In others, is actually uh, part of the supplemental materials, and so. We want to look a little more carefully and lift this particular 
um, minimum qual at the same level than um, the qualification for competency or the degree qualification. So, food for thought. We, we thought we'd leave you today with lots of things to think about. Yes? Is there an effort to work towards collecting the best practice or a recommendation for how to address that? Uh, thank you for asking that. There is actually, uh, an, there will be um, efforts uh, to do that. Uh, if you, uh, the first effort was actually um, done through the Rostrum article that was published uh, in the recent uh, Rostrum uh, of the State Academic Senate. Um, so I know your Academic Senate should have received a packet of copies. Uh, take a look at that article. It's also online uh, that addresses, begin to address the minimum qualifications. And we're hoping that we actually develop some tools um, that can uh, be shared with the field um, as we're thinking through how we can do a better job um, lifting um, this uh, second qualification. Yes? I know you're trying to get through your intro to high science. I was wondering if I could make a request that we um, cover the slide 32, kind of the details of that. I know that there's been discussion of that on this campus. The so, school of transcripts. Yeah, that's a perfect transition for us. That's where we wanted to go. You know, you know, we're like, we just love to do this work, and uh, sometimes we get um, we plan more than we can actually do. But uh, anyway, it, it's great material for you. But I'm going to ask you to go to that. We'll go to that slide um, 32, uh, which is this one. And so um, I, um, as I mentioned earlier. For um, a while, uh, our college was really uh, trying to um, make sure that um, we actually did a better job in our uh, uh, faculty diversification outcomes, actually, our employee outcomes in general. And um, as we started doing the uh, equity work and uh, uh, um, in becoming equity-minded, um, we realized um, that there was a, a, a lot of uh, uh, structural barriers that were part of the hiring process and certainly the hiring process for faculty. And so um, the, um, the, uh, one of the areas in, um, that we, have been, we were most challenged was about the construction of the job announcement or the job application information. And in the job announcement, job application information was in um, the, uh, use, the use of transcripts. And um, we had an equity uh, director at the district level that was a very courageous woman um, that really upset a lot of people <laughs> when uh, we started actually first talking about this. So know that if you're feeling funny and upset or it doesn't quite sit that well, some of what you have in the handout, uh, it's normal. It's okay. Um, it's actually trying to figure out how you work through it. Because what we found out um, in her uh, conversations with us and uh, in her work uh, to help us understand um, how, uh, um, how to do a better job with the job announcement or um, the application information was in the way that we kept using transcripts and the different kinds of things that bring about biases when you're actually reviewing a transcript. And so um, you can see uh, from the list that, um, that you have um, on the um, uh, slide 31, or I'm sorry, slide 32, um, the, um, that it's uh, about ageism. And so you have an example there. You have an example of elitism. And that one was a big one. Because um, we're so close to Stanford University that our faculty loves Stanford people. And there's nothing against Stanford. It's, uh, that's not the only place where our faculty will, could come from. And, um, and just as I'm, I'm sharing it with you, that this is a conversation that we've had in large committees and with the hiring committees. Um, again, very controversial. Um, we had a number of folks that were not happy about the removal of transcripts. Um, and then the whole idea of uh, the GPA. 
looking at someone's GPA and uh, biases um, uh, about you know that ability. High GPA means a better, higher ability than a lower GPA. 0.65, it's a lower ability than 3.5. So um, you know, I think the example of our student was um, uh, very telling, and sometimes in the way that we actually think about um, uh, the the GPA. And then there were other um, barriers um, that uh, were found um, uh, around folks looking for a particular sequence of courses that they had prepared for that were directly linked to um, the uh, discipline that they're applying for. And so where, where, where does that leave, what room does that leave for the experiences that someone may have that in fact can actually allow you to, um, to make a case for a particular candidate. And so, um, so those are, we wanted, I, we wanted to share those uh, barriers um, that we found in our journey. And, um, and I, I hope that uh, you have the conversation, if you haven't, um, about the uh, transcripts. Uh, ultimately, uh, my college um, and a couple of uh, uh, districts in my area removed uh, the transcripts out of the packet. And the transcript is only uh, required um, to, uh, uh, once the person is hired, to actually con you know, do the, the HR task no, of uh, uh, placing the particular faculty member on the scale, um, on the salary scale, and things of that nature. Yes. So, yes. In that situation, then, who would be the one that looks for the initial first main minimal falls and that they meet minimal falls? Because at our college, our committee does that. So, uh, the, this is uh, everyone, uh, different colleges may, may, may look at it differently. Um, uh, for, in my experience, uh, it was basically the uh, resume or the time that had um, the, uh, and, and of course the application, the completion of the application that asks for that information. So we are basically trusting that what folks are putting forward is uh, 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 correct. And then, uh, but there's not a check-in of that. So I have a question, Lynn, and that's, um, you make a super persuasive argument as to why looking at transcripts is not good from an equity lens and the biases, etc. But for us, I think we need to even back it up one step further and just ask the question straight up. Is there any EEO prohibition or will you fall um, afoul of EEO guidelines in the event your department decides they want to review transcripts? Because that's been a question um, on this campus. Well, I'm going to ask Greg to address that, but from my from my experience, no. Yeah. So going back to the discrimination slide, discrimination defined. There's two ways that discrimination, legal discrimination, could happen and could violate the EEO law. One is, as I look at those transcripts, I am willing to accept a white male who got a C in a course, but I hold any person who's black, or Hispanic, Asian, Native American, etc. They need to get a B or higher. That doesn't often happen consciously. I didn't sit down and write that down and go through grade it that way. But if you go back and look at the decisions that were made, that will often happen. And that's the exemplar piece of, I need somebody who's so highly qualified they can't be denied if they fit into a group that I have negative uh, connotations with. The other way that it can happen, and really it's actually the more concerning to me as the person responsible for this in my college, is the disparate impact of discrimination. And disparate impact is something that's been neutrally applied. Everybody has to go through the exact same test, so to speak. But the results are that one group, male or female, a specific race, succeeds at a much higher rate than any other group. And that gets to question number two and question number three there. Is, is there something about that characteristic that isn't entirely job related that results in this disparate outcome? And if we can't show conclusively that what we are screening for is a predictor of job success, then that is disparate impact discrimination. So to make it a, a much easier to understand example, if I have a lifting test for a job, it often happens in warehouse positions, 
the people doing the job actually have to lift 50 pounds, the fact that it screens out more women than men is okay because you functionally have to do it to perform. But if we go into that warehouse and we're using forklifts and machines to move everything and no one's ever lifting 50 pounds, even though we asked everyone to pass the same test, we have discriminated against female candidates who failed it because it's not actually part of the job. And I think it would be very hard to say getting a specific grade or taking a specific class was the make or break for you to be able to teach that subject is absolutely linked to that job requirement. It's an easy shortcut for us. If you show the mastery here, I can assume it here. But what a GPA measures is not the same as job. And so that would be my concern legally. I believe that when I was hired 25 years ago, um, I didn't have to have a transcript, but it said either a transcript or a list of courses that you've taken. And uh, I opted for the list of courses that I had taken because I didn't want to receive the Ds and the, you know, fail to withdraw Fs that I had on my transcript. But, uh, but now, uh, sitting on a hiring committee, um, I use a transcript to see, you know, the other question you had about the minimum call for uh, diversity. Um, I always look to see if, if, the, if the applicant has taken courses in multicultural, you know, uh, sensitivity or training. So, I mean, if if we remove the transcript, I think it would be important to be to be able to ask for the list of courses you've taken that you feel would qualify you or, or make you more qualified for the position. Because I know when I did mine, I was able to put all my Chicano studies, all the stuff that didn't really count probably for, for um, the counseling position, but it counted because I was being hired for EOPS, which required me to, which, you know, they wanted me to have more diversity in, in my background. So I was able to show that through my coursework. So I, I think there needs to be like a happy medium. So I think you actually talked about um, you uh, somewhat the happy medium. Um, so as we're thinking about candidates um, responding uh, to the second minimum call and that statement, then um, perhaps be more intentional in that, in the way that we construct that piece uh, that asks those kinds of questions. If you, you know, you can ask anything you want. And so um, that could be actually one way um, of, uh, of uh, um, not necessarily using uh, transcripts, but um, uh, in, uh, in uplifting the, the content and the importance of the of the second minimum qual uh, question, or, or uh, whichever way you as a as a college um, do that. Yes. Hey, good morning. One of the things I I re recall reading recently was that tr the use of transcripts has a disproportionate impact on female applicants and other individuals that the transcripts doesn't measure, for example, people working full time while trying to go to class, uh, people raising families. Um, can you touch on that a little bit? So when we, um, when we uh, looked um, at transcripts, you know, at, we were having that conversation, uh, all those elements actually came up of how there's so many parts of our students' uh, lives um, that, um, that, you know, reflected in the process uh, when you're looking at hiring. And so um, the, uh, um, the, the idea is that when you're looking at, um, at the, a candidate, it's really looking at the materials that you want them to um, complete or uh, submit. And so um, you have to figure it out. If you have an interest of knowing, um, you know, some of what may be um, happening for that particular uh, candidate, um, then how do you actually get to those questions um, in the process? And so whether it's at the beginning of the process, during the interview time, uh, and so forth. I, um, I, I was gonna argue in favor of transcripts, but I'm, I'm ambivalent right now. <laughs> but I have to say that they're one tool. They're just a tool. So like if somebody already is established as a career as a teacher or excellent in their field as the artist on the TED Talk, or in my case, a music composer or somebody, I would be less interested in their transcripts. But for green candidates that don't have much of a resume, 
and I want to know if they can teach music theory, then it's a way that I can know if they have all A's in music theory from an institution that is reputable. It seems like one way to give them a leg up. And personally, I can't imagine being biased in doing the transcripts in that way, but maybe I am. I mean, I'm, I'm open to that idea. And so, so again, um, we're bringing this to your attention for you to think through, have conversations. Um, all of the processes are yours, especially with faculty. Um, faculty policy and faculty procedure, uh, faculty hiring, uh, policy and procedure. This is a domain of the academic senate and under the purview of the senate. So very important that you have those, that conversation. I think one of the arguments for not including transcripts was that um, it doesn't take into account that some people may have a family or a second job or other things that pull them away from spending, committing all of their time to their educational studies. And um, that doesn't necessarily reflect that they have less ability as a teacher. And, um, and so those are, those are things that can impact someone's transcript. I'm just trying to say it might be honest. So I'm looking at the time, and I know we're going to be respectful of your time. We have a little bit more um, to cover with you. And so um, I don't know if you would be willing to stay for just a little longer. Um, but um, And then we have to make some decisions. So do we want to proceed with you? So I wanted to mention to you that um, the, in, uh, the, uh, you have, we're not going to get to the activity around interview questions, but I would like to point out um, that uh, some uh, what you have there is actually a good guideline um, to uh, use as you're thinking about these interview questions. Um, and so spend a little bit of time um, taking a look at that uh, also as a way of uh, continuous improving uh, your process. Yeah, and so we hope that these materials provide a starting point for future conversations. Obviously, two hours in one setting is not enough time to work through things of this complexity. Um, but we did want to give you some, some tools to go forward with as we think about how biases affect us and show up. Um, and so you can predict when you're more likely to rely on shortcuts, heuristics, mental shortcuts where you can say this person looks more qualified than somebody else. I'm willing to engage with this person and not this other person. And it's going to happen in times when you're emotionally stressed. And if you think about times when you have really been upset about something, the way that you talk and act changes. And it's often that kind of time when we have to come back later and apologize for something we said or the way we said it because we weren't consciously thinking about how a person is going to receive it. It happens when we have lack of objective information. And this is a hazard of my job all the time. I get presented with something very quickly. You have to make a decision. I don't have all the information I want, so I'm going to make the best decision available to me, which means I'm going to make a lot of assumptions. And I have to go back and look at that and say, did my decision reflect negative assumptions based on some characteristics like race, gender, and sex, and national origin, et cetera, the superficial characteristics. If we have expectations, this is one of the most difficult ones, I think, to overcome where all those images from media have been implanted in my brain, and when I see somebody from a different race or culture, all of that negative stereotype is there with them. Not that they brought it into the room, but that I've imposed it on them. And I've got to be able to consciously interrupt that and stop it. When we are distracted, which happens, you're reviewing um, application packets, someone calls, you answer the phone, you come back to it. What you read in the first half of it is not in the front of your mind anymore. You proceed right to the back half, and you make a snap decision on that person based more on assumptions and biases than you do on the actual information that you read and saw. If you're under pressure, and if you're not getting feedback, and you saw that in the video, asking people to tell you what they see, it's very hard because you've got to put yourself out there and be willing to hear a critique. But if you can do it, if you can find someone that you trust, a close friend to say, Look at my decision making, tell me what you see. Be very honest with me. You might learn something very surprising that you want to work on. And so we can address this by increasing our knowledge, accepting that we do have biases. I have them in all kinds of ways. It depends on, it determines things for me like who I am going to be friends with, who 
who I'm going to interact with, what streets and what towns I'm willing to drive down and which ones I don't. These are not all negative. These are not all necessarily bad. But I have to be aware of it. I can't walk around saying, I'm colorblind. I don't see your race and gender. I treat everybody the same, because it's fundamentally not true. I do treat you differently. I don't necessarily mean to, but I absolutely do it. And so once I have that knowledge and I acknowledge that that exists, then I can start to proactively monitor. When am I doing this and where am I doing this? In my private life, it's totally fine for me to have very strong political convictions, faith convictions, biases about who I, I will and will not interact with. It's completely fine. It's when I come into the professional sphere, it's no longer fine. And I've got to recognize that I cannot bring that into my work at a California community college because it violates laws and it violates our mission. And then, an easy way to do this is to role play. Put yourself into the position of being judged. And I think when you think about the transcript issue specifically, this gets a lot easier to think about. If someone were to go through and look at my history, they're going to see that I have an F in a community college class. I stopped going halfway through the semester. I did not like that instructor at all. And I had jobs. It was very easy to just prioritize that. I thought the college was just going to drop me. Like, I haven't shown up for six weeks. They're just going to drop me. No, they gave me an F on my transcript. And I went back and I said, why do I have an F? I stopped going to that class. Why didn't you just drop me? That's not the way the system works. Well, it should work that way when I walk up. But that's there. And if someone picks up my transcript and they don't know that history, and say, well, somebody who got an F in the class, I don't know that they have the motivation, the dedication, the persistence, but whatever it is that we're looking for, we're not going to hire them. I wouldn't want them to make that decision, would I? And so we think about ourselves being judged that way. And it gets easier to stop relying biases, because we usually don't apply biases to ourselves. Other things that you can do, write down your initial reaction. Even if it's just one word, jot your notes and be honest with yourself. Don't filter them out and make them look better as if somebody else were going to be looking at them. These are for you. Write your initial thought down, and then go back and look for the pattern. Well, wow, all the female applicants, I second guess the quality of their experience. I second guess what colleges they went to. I second you. Know, if you see that pattern now I can deal with it, but I've got to see it in order to deal with it. If you're brave enough, say it out loud and don't filter it. This is like you're driving down the highway and somebody just cut you off honestly, right? In that moment, I am willing to condemn people to all kinds of terrible fates, all because they made me find out if I can tap my brakes. And I did, and it worked out just fine. But before I ever stop and think, you know, somebody did that with the grocery cart in the store, I wouldn't say the same thing, right? Before I stop and think, I just blurt it out. You can do that as you're reviewing. Oh, I immediately don't like this. Wait, why did I have that reaction? Let me go back and look at this more closely. What am I responding to? Be very honest with yourself. Do you eliminate distractions so that you can put your active thought into this? Check your energy level when you get tired. You're more susceptible to relying on biases. Talked about seeking feedback from people. And then exposure is the big one. If you want to change the way a stereotype impacts you, interact with people that you believe in those stereotypes about. When I worked for a black man, for eight years, it changed a lot of what I understood about what it meant to be a black man. And Marvin Jordan has fundamentally altered the way that I see black men because of all of that experience we had together. You take him out of my life in that role, and I'm left with what? A gap to fill with maybe just your media and things, other things that I've seen. So exposure is huge. We have to be cautious around this because if they come into our thinking and decision making, can absolutely result in discrimination in our hiring process. And we end up hiring faculty and staff who do not successfully serve the diversity of our students because we're not prioritizing that. And so um, a, a few things um, that, I, um, that would be important as you think about um, this particular question, how do we address race in the hiring process, is to take a look at um, in, uh, implementing uh, bias interrupters uh, offer racial uh, bias training, and then um, develop and offer anti-racism education. And so I wanted to give you a few examples of each of this. Um, when we're looking at, at um, implementing uh, bias interrupters, uh, is uh, rewriting uh, the job description, for example, to uh, remove language that's discouraging, um, including a demonstration of skills during the interview process. Uh, recruiting applicants using uh, diversity-specific um, job boards, job fairs, and conferences. Um, not asking for a greater qualification than the position requires. 
or um, taking notes that, um, during the interview so that you have information rather than the impression of a candidate. And then, uh, of course, um, I think at your college, you have been uh, doing implicit bias training, and so continue that effort and uh, focus uh, the effort also a little bit more around racial bias, um, uh, since we actually do have to spend some time uh, in addressing racial bias. And um, the Academic Senate has actually been uh, very involved in working on developing tools uh, this year uh, to actually um, address uh, racial bias and then also address anti-racism uh, education. We had a resolution in plenary uh, that was actually approved by the body. And so this year, I will begin the process to um, figure it out uh, in which ways do we help um, and support the, um, the field in uh, reviewing policies and procedures and practices uh, for systemic racism and amending them. And so, um, and, and that's just one of the tasks that we hope uh, to be begin. Um, uh, today we do have um, colleges, a few colleges in California that are already uh, uh, doing anti-racism work, so we're actually learning from the experiences of other colleagues. So we get to the last part, which is the EEO role. And so, Greg, can you get us going with that one? So very quickly, um, going through any of you that serve as an EEO rep, and I would argue when I do these trainings at my college that we all, every person on that committee, I went to serve as an EEO rep basically, um, which is that we're monitoring all of these aspects of our hiring process for each other's behavior. We're holding each other accountable to the idea of we're not going to let biases and conflicts of interest creep into this. And so when someone says, as we are evaluating candidates, I just didn't get a good feeling about this. I don't think they'd be a good fit here. That's not a good statement to make in a hiring committee without further conversation. Whoa, whoa, what about them made you not think they would be a good fit or gave you that feeling? And then we translate that over to what are the specific knowledge, skills, and ability that you see applied in their experience that makes you project that they would not be successful here? When I can reframe that around those terms, I'm making a decision based on someone's competency in all aspects of the job they're going to do. If I can't get there, if you keep asking me that, I, I, that wasn't anything I necessarily directly saw, I just don't know, that's where I fear that they don't fit within my end group. That's what I'm really responding to here. And I'm not going to give someone the same consideration if they don't fit within my end group, and I can't tie it back to something tangible. If we see concerns like that, this is your, the way that your processes work, you're going to dictate, but at my college, I ask them to come immediately over and talk to me. And this is not a tattletale situation, this is not a get somebody in trouble situation. It's a, we need to facilitate a conversation. And it is perfectly fine for someone to acknowledge, I shouldn't be serving on this hiring committee. I have very firm beliefs about this, they contradict with the way that our process is designed, designed to work, and so I shouldn't participate in this one. Totally fine to step away. We do not view that as a negative thing at all. Actually, I'm quite encouraged that people are willing to say and do that. Facilitating that dialogue that we talked about, serving as a liaison to human resources. So in order to do that effectively, we've got to walk in with a, a degree of skepticism. And it's not that I think that my peers are biased, or that they're racist, or that they're sexist, or ageist, or any other negative thing. But I think that today might be the day that bias creeps into their thinking. And I allow that to be a possibility, and I listen to them. And if they never hear it, then it's great. But if I hear something that makes me pause and go, wait, you are proposing that we only interview male applicants out of this pool. I'm, I want to make sure that we are grounding that in information that's really relevant to this job, that we don't make that decision lightly. Then that is a source of skepticism that's very healthy for the process. It happens by asking people to clarify, what did you mean when you said that? Why do you have that feeling? How can we tie this back to the, uh, the content of our job and the criteria that we're looking at? And reminding them that we have this obligation got to follow these laws, we have to follow processes we built designed to allow us to hire, to hire people that are going to be highly effective in engaging with our students and encouraging that discussion. Things that you can see that's coming out, um, if someone comes in advocating strongly for a specific candidate, especially if it's before the time that that should be happening in your process, that's an immediate concern. Are you open-minded to the rest of this pool? If you've already, hey, I saw that Judy applied for this, this is great, we know we've got at least one fantastic person. 
I'm a little bit concerned about you coming in. Should you be serving on this committee with Judy in this pool? If we're sharing secondhand information, gossip, rumors about candidates that we know, because it happens. We're in communities that are close-knit. We know candidates coming from the outside, internal candidates apply. We've got to be able to spend secondhand information and rely specifically on first-hand things that we know that are absolutely job uh, relevant. And then look for any personal relationships. And it's probably unlikely, but if you're hiring a position, obviously, that has control over budgeting or contracts, you've got to be aware of any potential financial interests from a legal standpoint. So EEO reps help us do this by holding each other accountable, by increasing the level of conversation in the room, drawing out the people why they think what they think about candidates, so that we can all hear how this is grounded in the knowledge, skills, and abilities, their experience, how we can project that into success. We um, conclude our um, session today um, by um, thanking uh, all of you for um, being with us. Um, we apologize for the extra time. Um, now we know that we have to um, look at the content no? and uh, figure out how to condense the content a little bit more. So um, mindful of that. But we want to leave you uh, with this question. How can you contribute to achieving greater equity and diversity in higher? And so hope um, that today we gave you additional insights uh, to continue to do the good work um, that you're already doing at your college. I would like to uh, take a moment also to thank our video team um, that um, has been here um, uh, videoing the, the session, um, hopefully to share with others. And again, thanks uh, to each of you uh, for your participation and attendance today. Have a good day.